as we go into to the Proverbs this morning, uh, I think back to uh, when I was in high school going to a summer camp. It was a week-long camp, and grew up in Florida, went up to the Panhandle, and the camp was in uh, Panama City Beach, Florida. And so the camp was directly on the beach, and a rough childhood growing up. So we, uh, every day during our free time growing up, uh, or actually at that summer camp, uh, all the campers would go into the water, into the Gulf of Mexico. It's a beautiful white sand beach, a beautiful tide, beautiful waves, beautiful sun, beautiful place. Uh, about midweek, about 10 of us campers, myself and about 10 others, we sign up for uh, one of the workshops, and it was to learn how to snorkel. And so they started teaching us and training us in the pool. And about after 30 minutes of training and learning how to use a snorkel and not uh, drowning ourselves, we went out to the beach and out into the Gulf of Mexico uh, to snorkel. And shortly after getting into the water, uh, we could see maybe five, 10 feet out, it varied. Uh, but once we got out there, I was very grateful to be able to see what was in that water. You could see some fish, some trash, some other things that were in the water. Uh, but then as we were swimming out in the water, soon enough, the tide had brought in a ton of jellyfish. We can make out their, their, their clear jelly forms, their, their arms, their tentacles, just swarming all in the water. And so the group of us 10 who had the snorkels on, we started weaving and dodging. All these jellyfish were going to and fro. Sometimes we go under the jellyfish. Sometimes we go to the left of the jellyfish, to the right. We're dodging all these jellyfish. And finally, we got back to shore. And that was the coolest experience. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe what had just happened. We dodged all of these jellyfish. So I got onto the beach, and I saw one of the camp counselors coming this way. And so as soon as I saw him, as soon as I saw the camp counselor, I couldn't wait to tell the camp counselor. I said, hey, guess what I just saw? Before I could tell him, he said, jellyfish, right? I said, yeah. I said, well, how, how do you know that they're jellyfish, right? The reason the camp counselor was coming out to the water uh, was because camper after camper had gone to the nurse's station uh, complaining of, of stings, pains, and rashes uh, on their body. Uh, the counselor was coming to the beach to tell all the swimmers to get out of the water. Right? We had masks. We had snorkels. We saw the hazard ahead of time. We were able to navigate through the water because we had a vision of what was in front of us and what was around us. The other campers, they couldn't see what was in the water. They couldn't see what was in front of them, around them, underneath them, above them. And so they ran after into the jellyfish. They ran into the hazard one after another, after another, after another. Without being able to see, they got stung and stung, and stung, and stung. Going into this new year, as we celebrate entering into 2017, do you have a clear vision of what lies ahead? Or do you have no idea what lies ahead? Do you have no idea what lies around you? And moving forward in 2017, are you just going to run into one hazard after another? Are you able to have clear perspective to see what is in the water, to see the sin that you are to avoid? Or do you have no perception of where you're going at all? Just running into one pitfall, one sin after another. We'll see this morning, in order for us to move forward, not only in 2017, 18, 19, however long the Lord has us here on this earth, in order to to move forward, to glorify the Lord, and to avoid the pitfalls of sin, we need to have a clear vision, a clear perspective, a clear principle of how we are to move forward in this coming new year. Uh, now, I want to make it clear. Having a clear principle, having a clear perspective, having a clear vision of the coming year, of where we are to go, does not mean that the year is going to be easy. It does not mean that we're not going to struggle and have hardships. But what it does mean is that we're going to be able to intentionally and purposely plan to glorify God with our lives 
and to be purposeful and intentional about avoiding and rejecting the sin that is hazardous and inflicts us. This morning we're going to see three things. What, why, and how. What. What is the guiding principle that will help us give clarity and vision for this new year as we plan and look ahead? What is the principle that will help us see what's in front of us and around us and help us navigate? Why? Why this principle matters so much? And then lastly, how? How do we apply this principle in our lives beginning today? If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs 16, and this morning we're going to look at 1 through 9. Proverbs 16, verses 1 through 9. You can find the book of Proverbs in your Old Testament towards the left-hand side of your Bibles. Uh, one way is perhaps just finding the very middle, opening it up, uh, depending on how big your glossary or index or how many maps you have in the back of the book. Uh, you should land around Psalms, around Proverbs. Proverbs 16, we'll be looking at 1 through 9. The book of Proverbs is a collection of, 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 of wise sayings from various authors. Uh, most of them are written by King Solomon, and he makes it very clear the intent of these sayings. Uh, in, in, in 1, 2 through 4 that was read earlier, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealings, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. The purpose of the Proverbs is to give wisdom to the reader who obeys them so that they can live godly lives. Those who obey the Proverbs will live godly lives that honor God. Those who abandon the Proverbs will disobey God and live ungodly lives instead. The Proverbs, such as the one we're going to read this morning, gives us guidance, wisdom, how we are to live and to move forward in order to glorify God with our lives. In chapter 16, starting with verses 1 through 3, let's look at the guiding principle. What is the guiding principle to help us navigate through the new year? The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What is the guiding principle that kicks off this verse? First and foremost, we must understand this principle. That God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. God determines every outcome. We're going to see throughout this proverb that there's a tension that lies ahead. That there's this tension that, yes, God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. And yet at the same time, we are absolutely accountable for our actions. God is sovereign. He decides every outcome. And at the same time, we're accountable for everything we say, think, do, and everything we don't think, say, or do. How is God, or what is his sovereignty? What does this look like? The plans of the heart belong to man. The heart of man, our motives, our intentions, our, our desires. We can desire all we want. Our desires belong to us, right? We can have a one-week plan. We can have a one-year plan. We can have a five-year plan. We can have a 10-year plan. We can desire all that we want. We can have all the plans laid out before us. We can have everything mapped out before us. We can say to ourselves, man, in one year, I'm going to graduate. In five years, I'm going to have a family. In 10 years, I'm going to have 10 kids. In 20 years, I'm going to have 20 kids. In 30 years, I'm going to be a millionaire. You can have all these dreams and aspirations. They belong to you. Dream all you want. But who decides the outcome? But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The heart and the tongue, what lies within in the tongue, what comes out is so closely tied. What is desired within belongs to you. But what is the result? What's going to come out? God decides that. He is sovereign. He is in 
control. Plan all you want for 2017. Desire all you want for 2017. But what's going to happen is going to be determined not by you and I. It's going to be determined by God. So what is the means by which God determines the outcome? Verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. God determines the outcome by weighing, by being the ultimate judge. Everyone is pure in their own eyes, meaning that everyone thinks that they're right. right? We all live by our own standards. We are the norm. Everybody else is the extreme. Right? We are the normal. Everybody else is crazy. We have our own standards, and what we live by, we think is right, we think is good, by which we judge the world. And while our outward actions, we can fool everybody around us, however, God sees the truth, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. He sees what is truly within. God is sovereign. He sees what's truly within. And what does he do because of that? Verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The result, desire all you want, but it is the Lord who establishes your work, meaning it is the Lord who brings to fruition what it is you do or you don't desire. How do we get our work blessed by God? How do we get what we strive for to come to fruition by God's might and power. Don't you want to know this? Looking ahead into 2017, what can you do so that God will bless what you do? What well, says here, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So what does this mean to commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established? If you commit your work to the Lord, God will bring it to fruition. If you commit your work to the Lord, God will bless what you do. So does it mean this? Go and do whatever you want. Just make sure you say, I commit this to the Lord. And you'll establish it. He'll bring it to fruition, right? Go and seek after your flesh. Go and seek after your desires. Go and seek after your own kingdom. And commit it to God. And he'll bless it. No. It, it, but how often do we do that? How often do we chase after sin and pray that God would bless that sin? How often do we pray and ask God to give us the things that are distracting us from God? How often do we continue to seek after those things that are pulling us away from a relationship and glorifying God? And asking that God would bless and to grow it. It, it would be like if, if I were to, to, to cheat on my wife, Nellie. If I were to commit adultery on her and to have an affair on my wife. But then to expect and to think, Nellie, I commit this affair to you. Right? This affair is for you, wife. And then she's going to say, oh, in that case... Blessings to you, husband. May you prosper in all you do. No. But how often do we cheat on our relationship with God? How often do we seek after these things of God and then go behind his back and say, God, but this is for you. Would you glorify and honor this? To commit the work of our hands doesn't mean that we get a free pass to do whatever we want. To commit the work to the Lord means that we get to surrender our hearts, that we get to surrender our desires to obey God so that he may bless our obedience and our surrendering to him. It means that we surrender our kingdom so that God may use us to build his kingdom, to establish his kingdom, and to build it and to give it and to grow it. 
what is the principle that we need to live by for this coming new year? In order to see what's ahead behind, in order to avoid the hazards, we need to live according to the standard of this. The principle is that God is sovereign, that he's in control of everything. We can desire and plan all that we want, but it is God who brings it to fruition. God is in control, and it is those who surrender and obey him who prosper and are blessed. Why does this matter, though? Does this matter? As I think about this, I don't know if it matters to obey God. When you look around the world, your classmates, your coworkers, who's prospering? Who's successful? Is God really in control? How come there's dictators torturing people, killing people, but their work is established on it? They're powerful, right? Is God really in control? Does this principle matter going forward? Are you just being handcuffed while everyone's getting advantage in the world, right? Maybe you have classmates, not you. Your classmates are are cheating, they're lying, they're getting answers before the test. And they're getting praise. They're getting good grades. They're advancing academically by dishonoring God. Is God really in control? Man, may you have coworkers who, who are morally, ethically corrupt, but they're just climbing that corporate ladder like no other. They're skyrocketing. They're making so much money. They're buying all of these things and they're so rotten, and they're so corrupt. They're turning their back on God, and their work is being established. And it makes you wonder, is God truly the one who's in charge? These people have turned their back on God, and they're operating outside of God. Is God really in charge of it all? How often do you see these people, and you think to yourself, man, so lucky, right? Or how many times do you get frustrated and think to yourself, Why can't I do that same thing too? Why do I have this conscience? Why do I have the Spirit telling me no? Why does this matter? Is God truly in control? Let's look at verses 4 and 5. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Those who have turned their backs on God, oftentimes in this world, it looks like they're operating outside of God's control. Oftentimes it looks like God has no handle on them. But Solomon tells us in verse 4 that this is how powerful, this is how sovereign God is. That everything, everyone has been set by God for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of the trouble. So the answer is no. Even those who have turned their backs against God, they are not outside of God's sovereignty. What's more, verse 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Those who have turned their backs on God, though they may look successfully worldly, make no mistake that they are receiving God's judgment, they are being punished by God currently, and they'll receive that judgment, that punishment for eternity as well. Why does it matter? It matters because God is sovereign and nothing, and no one is out of his control or command. But again, what do you do with that then? What do you do with those, those, those people who are operating against God? How do you feel about that? They seem to be prospering, right? Uh, now, anyway, we have two dogs, uh, Willow and Doodle. And so they're both about 10 pounds each. And you know, we spare no expense on the food we kept them, right? So um, I fall for whatever marketing ploy the animal companies do. I, I'm, I'm a sucker for it. So 
Um, if the bag says, all natural, no filler, I'm going to buy that one. Right? Okay, this one's $5 more, but look, it says, good for joints. I want to spend that $5, right? This one's $10 more. It's good for joints and coat. No question. $20 more, it says, good for joints, coat, and eyes. I spare, I'm going to get that one, right? You know, dog food, it comes in different sizes. There, there's the big bags that up front it costs more, but in the long run, it's actually cheaper, right? Because you're going to get it in bulk. I opt to get the small bags one at a time. It's going to be more expensive, but the dogs get a fresher food experience, right? Because in a big bag, by the time you get halfway through, it, it airs out, the, the, the food's gotten all kind of, kind of crunchy, and it, it doesn't feel the same anymore, right? So I won't get the small bags. I want them to have that fresh pop open, let them breathe it in, uh, get that easy, smooth, crunchy experience for the dog. I'm not going to spare any expense, right? I've got this dog food. It's good for my dogs. It's healthy for my dogs. It's going to make them see further. It's going to make their coats shine. It's going to make their joints healthy. Every now and then, my dogs will get hungry. Doodle, sometimes, he won't eat the food. I'll get down on one knee, and I'll hand feed my dog. There are other times... They'll get hungry. They'll go to the rug. They'll squat and they'll poop. <laughs> they'll squat and they'll poop. They're hungry, and they'll well, they don't eat like that. They'll eat the poop. Right. Sometimes my dogs get hungry. They poop and they eat their poop. I've told them many times: Don't eat your poop. It's not good for you. How many times, actually never, I've never looked at my dogs eating their poop and thought to myself, lucky dogs. I've never looked at my dogs eating their own poop and gotten frustrated and said to Nellie, why can't I eat my poop? Right? <laughs> why? Because that poop makes them sick. It makes them unhealthy. And they have something far better to eat. If your friend is cheating on a test to get ahead, don't look at them and think, wow, lucky. Because they're eating poop. When your coworkers are morally and ethically corrupt and getting ahead, don't get frustrated and say, why can't I eat that poop too? Because to cheat, lie, and steal, to operate in a way that goes against God makes us sick and unhealthy. Because that's sin and it's hazardous to our lives. Don't get jealous or envious of those living in accordance with the world's standards because God has given us something far greater to live for, far something better to eat, far something that's more nourishing, that'll grow us for today, tomorrow, and for eternity. Right? When we see the world operating under the world's standards, do not grow envious, do not grow frustrated, wishing that you could eat that poop. Right? Instead, have compassion for them, pray for them, Look and see that they're living and they're compromising. They're forfeiting something that's so great. They're forfeiting eternity for something that won't last but for a second. What is the standard or the principle we're to live by in order to navigate through this new year? Know that God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. He judges not just what our actions are, but what lies within our hearts, our motives, what is in the insides, why we do why we do it. And in judging those things, he determines 
the outcome? What are those things that God chooses to bring to fruit, to bless and to build? The works that have been committed to the Lord. Those who have surrendered their work, their energy, their time, their relationships, their resources to the Lord, God will bless that work. God will bless the building of his kingdom. God will bless the making of disciples. God will bless witnesses of Jesus Christ. And why does this matter? As we look at the world and the sin around the world, may we not grow weary or frustrated. May that propel us further to stick to this standard. That there are those who are operating against what God desires. There are those who are operating and sinning against the Lord. But even in that, God is sovereign. God will weigh, God will judge, God will discipline and punish and pour out his wrath. How? How then are we to live as those who understand and surrender to God's sovereignty? Verses 6, sorry, verses uh, 7 through 9. When a man's ways please the Lord, uh, sorry, six, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Uh, First application point this morning, in order for us to live as those who are under God's sovereignty, to obey him, to be blessed, to build his kingdom, this coming year, have a relationship with God holy. Know God for his love and also fear God for his greatness, that he's just for his wrath. Know God holy. Both aspects of God. Yes, God is love. Yes, grace and mercy. But also fear God. That he's just and powerful as well. Without fearing God, God's love, God's love means very little, right? And without knowing God's love, then fearing God is very hopeless. For those, oftentimes we operate under one more than the other. So application or encouragement to you this morning is to know both. Uh, For those who who are operating under God's grace, praise God. But those who who lack of fear of the Lord and think that you can sin and keep on sinning, pray and seek the fear of the Lord. Know that God will not be mocked. Know that God is being patient for a short while, but his judgment is coming. For those who only see and have a fear of God, man, praise God for that. But maybe for some of you, you don't see the loving side. You don't see God's grace and mercy. Perhaps you're still trying to earn your own salvation, which is impossible. Perhaps you still feel unworthy. Perhaps you still feel that you are not loved or cherished by God. I will pray that this coming year, you navigate through the year understanding your value and your place as a creation of God. That you're precious and you're loved and your value comes from being made in his image. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that you're no longer an enemy of God, but a child of God. Verse seven. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. A reflection, a result of this relationship. Just as sinners, we as sinners are enemies of God, those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ are now children of God. Once enemies of God, we now have peace with God. Verse 8, second application. As you plan, as you seek out this coming new year, this is what we are to strive for. To know both God in his love and also to fear him. And then in verse 8, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Better is a little with righteousness 
than great revenues with injustice. For those of you who have already planned this year to be the biggest and best year yet, let's rewrite that plan. For those of us in this life who are still looking to get and to obtain more, let's rewrite that life plan. Better is little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. More important than seeking more things, more stuff, more important than obtaining and having much and more. Seek this instead. Seek righteousness. Seek that which is good, that which is pleasing to God. And this is so important because oftentimes, more often than not, in our pursuit of much, it is righteousness that we forfeit first. It is better to have a little and to be in good standing with God than to have great revenues, than to have a ton of stuff and have a broken relationship with God. This year, rewrite your plan. Not to grow and to succeed by the world's measures, but what does it mean to grow and to seek after obedience and righteousness with the Lord? Verse 9 wraps up this part of the psalm and echoes verse 1. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Plan all you want. It is God who determines the outcome. How does he determine it? By judging our hearts, by looking within. Those who strive to build their own kingdoms will suffer his wrath, his discipline, his punishment. Those who seek to glorify God, he will establish the works of their hands. He will build and to build to fruition those who obey him. As we go forward here this morning, it's great that we can start the new year here worshiping together. By praising him through song, by meditating on his word, and by going to him and meeting with him at the Lord's table. At the beginning of each month, we come and we observe the Lord's table to help us to regain a focus on why we do what we do and how we are to do it. As 2016 comes to a close, whether it's in the news or the media or even social media, I think more so this year than others, people have been lamenting about the people that have died, right? Whether it's celebrities, musicians, uh, lives that have been lost through, through, through terror, natural disasters, whatever it might be. And, and as I'm reading these articles, as I'm looking at social media, there's, there's this common outcry, this common plea that there's so much death that 2016 has been so hard and tough, and so many people have died in 2016. I hear this echoed throughout. Articles and people say this, right? So many people have died in 2016. 2016 has been such a hard year. 2016 needs to end. So many people have died. 2016 needs to end. On one hand, I, I get that. On one hand, people are expressing their sorrow, their grief. 2016 needs to end. But on another hand, through a biblical perspective, it's a very hopeless plea. 2016 needs to end. Why? 
because there's no more death in 2017? 2016 was so hard, it needs to end. Why? Because hardships end at 2016, and it's just a piece of cake in 2017. No. If our hope is in a new year, then we'll be left hopeless. If our hope is that today is January 1st, we're going to be hopeless. Come the end of January, we're going to be dreading and thinking, oh, this again. By February, by March, we're going to hope it's summer. By summer, we're just going to hope it's the holidays. By the holidays, this time next year, we're going to be saying to ourselves, 2017 needs to end. But it's a hopeless pattern. Our hope is not in the new year. Our hope is not in the date or the time. But our hope is in Jesus Christ. Because the new year is not going to stop sin, is not going to stop death. But Jesus Christ has overcome sin. Jesus Christ has overcome death. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have sinned, you have sinned. We come into this world as a deficit. We come into this world as sinners. For those who do not believe, they are condemned already. Because of our sin, each and every one of us are deserving of punishment, deserving of death physically and eternally, to suffer in conscious torment under God's wrath. And we have no way of saving ourselves. There's no amount of good we can do in our lives to restore our relationship with God because what has broken our relationship with God is sin. No matter how much we do, it does not get rid of that sin. It does not restore our relationship with God. Uh, For some of us, we hope that we can attain enough knowledge to save ourselves, but no amount of knowledge gets rid of sin. For some of us, we hope that our status if we become important enough in this life, then God will accept us. But the sad thing is no amount of status, no matter how important you are in this world, it does not get rid of sin in your life. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So God, in his love, in his perfect plan, made a way through his son, Jesus Christ who's born, who lived without sin, to become the perfect sacrifice, to take our place, to take the guilt, the penalty of shame, so that Christ's righteousness can be our own. We can have new life in him. We can have the forgiveness of sins. Just as Christ died and rose again, we can participate with Christ in his death and his resurrection if we repent and we believe. To repent, to turn away from sin and to turn to God, to admit that you're a sinner, confess and to ask for forgiveness. And in that, believing that Jesus is who he says he is. And the promise is this, that your sins will be forgiven, that your relationship will be restored with God, that you'll no longer be an enemy of God but a child of God, instead. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, let's reflect on our relationship with God. Let us reflect on our relationship with our friends, our family, our co-workers. Let us reflect on our plan for this coming year. For those of you who have set to Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, take a moment to remember Remember what Christ has done in your life. Reflect on what he is currently doing in your life. And rejoice. Rejoice that he's coming back one day. Rejoice that you have the blessed assurance today, tomorrow, and forevermore. 
this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, please refrain from the bread and the cup. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would convict you of your sin. That the Holy Spirit would open your eyes, would show you that without a shadow of a doubt, that you are in need of a Savior. And that you would repent and believe in Jesus Christ. As you are ready, come forward, take both elements, the bread and the cup. Return to your seat and we'll eat and drink.